Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. The United States of America maintains the strongest air force in the world, with a massive fleet of over 5,200 aircraft flying to and from 59 active duty bases around the country. The mission gets even scarier, as some of these aircraft must extend their services to the roughly 750 U.S. foreign military bases spread across 80 nations of the world. Have you ever wondered how jet fuel is transported to power these planes to keep them airborne? even when they fly so far from home. In today's feature, we will explore the ingenious methods used by the U.S. to safely transport massive quantities of jet fuel to far-off military bases around the globe. One of the most notable fuel transfer solutions for the U.S. Air Force came with the introduction of this versatile workhorse called the C-17 Globemaster III. The idea for the C-17 Globemaster was initiated in 1980. When the U.S. Air Force asked for a large transport aircraft capable of in-flight refueling and operations on rough fields located in its most forward bases. McDonnell Douglas exceeded this expectation by building a colossal flying marvel that could land on 19,000 airfields of all categories used by force. During an airdrop mission over Afghanistan on 20th December 2010, the C-17 fleet surpassed 3 million flight hours. The C-17 had covered a distance equivalent to 1.13 billion nautical miles which translates to one C-17 Globemaster III completing 2,360 round trips to the moon. To complete long-haul missions involving bulk fuel transportation, the C-17 is fitted with an innovative aerial bulk fuel delivery system. The system consists of three fuel bladders strapped inside the plane's massive cargo hold. There are two refueling pumps, two diesel-driven engines, flexible hoses, and delivery nozzles. Both bladders can hold up to 6,000 gallons per flight. At the destination, the discharge process is simple. First, the temperature and other important safety information and statistics are checked. Then the airmen in charge of the delivery, alongside the load master, go to work, connecting and tightly securing the appropriate nozzles linking the delivery pipes from the C-17 bladders to the receivers.
The fuel can be transferred into stationary fuel receptacles, fuel trucks, or other aircraft on the base. In situations where ground delivery may not be feasible, the C-17 cargo bay is also adapted to hold fuel in smaller separate containers for air dropping. Moving palletized fuel parcels into the C-17 cargo bay takes teamwork and collaboration. Once inside, airmen firmly secure the rolling pallets onto the floor rails. They arrange each pallet on a single row and attach them to the static line before takeoff. Once over the drop zone, the rear cargo bay door slowly opens. The entire row is released, and the static line automatically deploys the parachutes on exit. The altitude range for such operations varies between 750 feet to 1,200 feet with the C-17 cruising between 130 and 150 knots. The C-17 itself is a massive fuel consumer, capable of burning 21,000 pounds of fuel per flight hour. This oversized airlifter is one of the biggest fuel consumers in the entire U.S. Air Force fleet. The plane, however, retains the advantage of air refueling that enables it to sustain mobility missions further than 2,400 nautical miles. The first ever successful aerial refueling was completed at Rockwell Field in San Diego on June 27, 1923. When one DH-4B aircraft used a hose to pass gasoline to another DH-4B. This milestone in aviation history was quickly adopted by the entire industry. The aerospace sector was not left behind. Fast forward to 1991, with NASA coming on the scene to test the air-to-air -air refueling of its SR-71 Blackbird, receiving from a U.S. Air Force tanker. By this time, the U.S. Air Force had really stolen the show with massive dedicated flying fuel stations like the KC-135 Strato tanker. Between 1956 and 1965, an astounding 732 KC-135 Strato tankers were produced and delivered to the U.S. Air Force. Of that number, almost 400 remain in active service today. This 100,000-pound mammoth plane can reach a range of over 1,300 nautical miles. 
hauling 200,000 pounds of JP-4 jet fuel for aerial distribution. Through its powerful refueling boom, the plane can push out more fuel in eight minutes than the quantity of a gas station fuel pump will release in 24 hours. Its three-man crew consists of a pilot, co-pilot, and boom operator, who closely monitors the entire aerial fuel delivery process. Though the foundational principle remains unchanged, this century-old process has evolved into two main methods of delivery. In probe and drogue refueling, the tanker aircraft simply releases a long flexible hose, or drogue, and waits for the receiving aircraft to connect before refueling can begin. The drogue head features a funnel-shaped basket that makes it easier for the extended probe of the receiving aircraft to be guided in. Both components are launched at the push of a button and digitally monitored from the comfort of the cockpit. The probe and drogue method was successfully tested with an unmanned aerial vehicle in 2015 when an X-47B was fueled mid-air by an Omega K-707 tanker over Maryland. Zero 27, and that was at uh, time 55, so it's... it's The boom method, on the other hand, is older and more complicated. It requires the constant supervision of a boom operator, who must deploy and guide the tanker's rigid boom, or tube, into the tank aperture of the receiving aircraft. Though the boom method discharges fuel at a considerably faster rate, it presents several shortcomings. The mechanism can only refuel one aircraft at a time. Throughout the operation, the boom operator is a mere 20 feet from the cockpit of the receiving aircraft. As a general rule, pilots must visually check and be sure they carry the correct fuel quantity and type for the aircraft they must refuel. Fuel control is not limited to the visual checks conducted by the pilot before takeoff. The entire Department of Defense uses about 12.6 million gallons of fuel daily. At the same time, the U.S. Air Force spends about $10 billion annually for the fuel needed to run its planes and power its bases worldwide. Managing such quantities of this volatile liquid is no easy task. Especially when it comes to standard quality control. This explains the presence of high-profile fuel laboratories manned by fuel specialists working around the clock to ensure every gallon of fuel is burning just as it should. 
Samples are collected and tests are conducted to make sure fuels are free of contaminants like water, dust, sand, rust, and other potentially dangerous sediments. Every single gallon of fuel must be thoroughly scrutinized in these facilities, which possess the equipment and staff to conduct thousands of tests and analyses every month. At the time of use, the fuel must strictly meet stipulated specifications from when it was received at the base and throughout its storage period to when it is issued. Fuel storage is also another area of concern for the Air Force. Most of their fuel storage tanks are buried underground to maintain cooler temperatures and reduce the risk of explosion. However, steel tanks buried underground are exposed to a damp environment, leading to faster corrosion and a higher risk of fuel contamination. Sometimes, these tanks need to be removed, repainted, repaired, or simply scrapped for recycling. Whether buried underground, strapped on pallets in a cargo bay, or inside massive fuel bladders, proper fuel storage remains integral to the various ingenious methods developed by the U.S. Air Force for worldwide transportation and distribution. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.